Thank you very much indeed. It's lovely to see a good audience. Um, I was just, uh, have you, any of you ever heard of a website called Quora, where people can type in questions and then people can answer the questions? I just got an email reminding me, and it said, as you have asked, answered a previous question uh, on the South China Sea, could you help this person? And it says, should I go to South End on sea? I thought, well, that's <laughs> <laughs> entirely different set of questions. Um, I, I, I have written uh, a journal article which has just come out in, in a journal called Modern China. Uh, so if you are fascinated by the history and the deep history, then I would recommend that. It's, it's, it's on open access at the moment. Um, but in that article and in this, I always acknowledge all the people whose work that I have made use of. Uh, I don't want to pretend that this is all my own, uh, all my own efforts. Um, so this is, part of the, this is the part of the world we're talking about, obviously. One China there, the other China there. Um, and then these are, this is Vietnam, uh, Paracel Islands are here, um, these are the Spratleys down here, named after an East End boy called Richard Spratley, uh, this is the Scarborough Shoal here, and this is a little place called Pratas Island, which is currently occupied by Taiwan up there. Um, so uh, feel free to ask other questions, but that, that's pretty much all the geography you need for this. This is what the islands look like. Uh, these are the biggest natural islands, and as you can see, a uh, runway just about fits on the largest one, Ituaba. Um, they sort of stick off the end of the, the, the other ones. Um, these are among the smallest natural ones. Um, it is bizarre to think that, uh, you know, potentially we could have a very serious regional conflict about that piece of rock, potentially. Um, they don't look like that now. So bear in mind that's what Subi Reef used to look like about five years ago. That's what it looks like now. Okay, that's that little that little rocky bit. Is that one there? This is uh, a three-kilometer-long runway built by China. Uh, there's as much area inside this reef as there is in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, um, and the whole area is uh, you know is a is a very large military base. And this is, this, there are three like this and, and four others uh, down in the Spratlys, all built by China in the last few years. Um, this is what all the fuss is about, really, is this line. And I'm going to talk quite a lot about how, this line and where it came from. Uh, China calls this it's the U-shaped line. Uh, well, I call it the U-shaped line. Other people have other names for it, the nine-dash line, because originally there were 11 dashes in 47, and then in the most recent iteration there were only nine dashes. But as you can see, the dashes are not precisely drawn. It's a rather vague claim, and the meaning of the claim is very vague too. Exactly what is China claiming? We're not sure. <laughs> right, um, so this is, the, this is the Vietnamese coast up here. Um, this is the bit of sea that Vietnam claims the rights to, its exclusive economic zone. Uh, a Spanish energy company called Repsol has the rights to these blocks in yellow. Uh, last year it tried to do a little drill here, <coughs> sorry, here, uh, and then this year it tried to do a little drill here. And both times uh, China threatened it with war uh, if it went ahead and did so. China threatened to attack Vietnamese positions out here if it went and drilled. Um, this is obviously a very, very, very long way away from China. So the question is, why does China claim this bit of territory <coughs> on this bit of sea? Um, well, this officially is the southernmost point of Chinese territory. And if you look very closely, you'll see there isn't any territory there. Uh, that's a, an area called the James Shoal. Um, and it's, the nearest bit of territory is actually 22 metres below sea level. Uh, China calls it the Zengmu Ansha, and this is our first clue, is that Zengmu is simply the transliteration of James, J.M. Zengmu. Uh, so there's a story here, and by the time I answered this story, I kind of uh, managed to tell the story of how China came to claim this piece of territory. This is about 200 kilometres off the coast of Borneo, uh, and 1,500 kilometres away from Hainan Island in southern China. It's actually down there. That's where the James Shoal is. And it's officially the southernmost point of Chinese territory. But as you can see, it's, it's nothing to do with a continental shelf. This is quite deep sea in the middle. It's an entirely different explanation altogether. So let's have a little look at the history of uh, who's done what in the South China Sea. Um, well, and when I was researching the book, I went to this place in the Philippines, uh, El Nido on Palawan Island here. And there's a fantastic uh, excavation under this uh, limestone pillar. There's a, a cave at the bottom. Um, and at the bottom of this, in this, 
in this cave was a 5,000-year-old boat burial. So that the person had been buried in, a, in stones that were shaped like a boat, sailing into the darkness of the cave and into the afterlife. And along, buried along with them were various shells and beads and necklaces and things which could only have come from what's now Vietnam, the other side of the South China Sea. So 5,000 years ago, you have people voyaging across the South Pan China Sea, or more likely from island to island to island, hopping, and actually various forms of uh, trading networks were clearly taking place because there were records of uh, things from this part of the world arriving uh, in China and being recorded as such, and they've obviously been brought there by people who are maritime. Um, there are even records of, um, uh, I think, sea cucumbers coming from what is, in effect, northern Australia, making, you know, I'm not saying that one person made a journey all the way, but trading networks where things were exchanged over relatively large distances um, quite a long time ago. So you have these pre-existing networks and these people still exist to some extent you find these water people around the coasts of southeast asia to this day they have different names in different places uh the bajau in um, uh, malaysia and uh, philippines indonesia the orang laut the danjiao in china the molken these are these are in burma i took uh, when i was there but they're basically nom sea nomads sea gypsies that have lived there and, and maintain a, a very old ancient lifestyle to this day um, so they are really the people that were the first maritime voyagers. They were the first people that discovered the islands and, and, and the reefs. Um, but, of course, they had no concept of ownership or states or so forth. The next kind of level of voyaging up, really, is sort of um, early Middle Eastern voyages, Arab, Persian, Indian. I mean, this mosque in Guangzhou I know, dates back to the 7th or 8th centuries. It was built by people that were trading with China. They were the ones that were voyaging um, across the South China Sea, um, there's evidence from, from Chinese um, texts of um, traders there, massacres going on and various um, uprisings along the way. Um, so really, before the Europeans arrive, you have uh, different sort of entrepots that dominate the trade. And this is largely because of the weather, but the fact that the monsoon blows in different directions at different times of the year, and that tends to become the vessels. So then they... They, they, they sort of they would they would pause at different points, and whoever controlled this these sea lanes uh, at different times was obviously onto a good thing. Um, and you know, various different kings, rulers <coughs> battled it out for supremacy in different periods. So, well before the Europeans arrive in the in the 15th, 16th, 16th century, um, you have pre-existing um, civilizations, and you see some of them. I mean, a lot of these people are built out of wood, and their things have disappeared, but. For example, the towers in Champa or some of the, I mean, fortunately, Shu Vijari is now buried under a petrochemical works, um, but um, some of the others you know, have left um, decent, decent relics behind them. Um, so, for example, here is a, a carving from 800, um, and it clearly shows a Southeast Asian style ship with outriggers and so forth, the kind of thing you might see even today. Um, now, the question is how much was were the well, let's, let's loosely call it China, um, involved in this? Well, not really much until the 11th century, um, and then only gradually afterwards. And, what, of course, what's in, you know, significant in the modern-day political context is that nobody cared about the islands in the middle of the sea. They were a, a hazard to shipping. There was nobody living there to trade with. So, basically, people went around the outside of the South China Sea, much more logical way to go, safer and much more profitable. Um, and so these are, I imagine people have heard of uh, Cheng He, the, uh, the Chinese diplomat that sailed on ships as far as East Africa. Well, from those voyages and other voyages around the same time, these are a set of navigational instructions and then a modern planning of those, plotting of those on a, on a modern map. And the point is, you can see that you know, nobody was really interested in going through the middle of the South China Sea. The same thing, this is the, um, the Selden map, which is in the Bodleian Library, um, which was acquired, in inverted commas, from a, ca a Chinese captain. Various theories about where it was made. Some suggest it was made by a Chinese um, family down here. Others that it might have been in Luzon. Um, but what's significant about this is that on the map, you can see um, routes all centred uh, on Quanzhou, but again, all going around the outside of the South China Sea. So by the time this is, this is 17, mid-17th century, 
Um, so already an, a network of trading arrangements, um, but nothing in terms of, you know, there's no sense, I think, of, of territorial ownership of, of any of these islands. Um, and one of the reasons why people would, would sail around the outside was that there was a belief that there was a very long line of reefs and islands along the coast of what's now Vietnam. Um, this, is, you know, this is a European map from 1630, but even a couple of centuries later, you still have the same imaginary islands marked on, this is a French map. Um, and people, I guess the Europeans when they arrived, must have got this information from local people, that it's, you can't sail directly across there because you'll get wrecked. Um, it wasn't really until um, British surveyors showed up in the early 19th century that more accurate mapping was allowed or enabled, um, and you start to see uh, better, much better definitions of the Chinese coast, Hainan, and here, and then gradually working out where the Paracel Islands are, for example, here. And that really opened up uh, navigation from Singapore to Hong Kong and uh, made it much less dangerous to travel across this part of the world. Um, the Paracels, I mean, this is a good, uh, good piece of little history. If you ever want to know the, the names of the islands, they're all named after, or at least the uh, one half of them, are all named after managers of the East India Company. Uh, Patel, Robert, Duncan, Drummond, Money, uh, they were all there. Um, I think Patel was um, Victor Virginia Woolf's grandfather or something like that. Um, but the point is, essentially, during this process, again, although there's navigation, uh, there is no government. Um, and so even as late as 1891, you have some uh, pirate uh, instances. Piracy is pretty, pretty rife, um, and it continues you know, into the 20th century. Uh, there is an aftershot of this uh, scene when they've all been beheaded, but I thought I'd spare you that one. Um, but the point is that as late as the end of the 19th century, no government... Uh, there's no evidence of any government really claiming ownership of, of, of these islands uh, or reefs and rocks. Here's a, map, a Chinese map from 1897 that didn't even bother to mark the, the disputed islands. But that all changes uh, post, I mean, and this is what my article about, which is, is about, which has just been published. It's what happens in the early 19th century. The period between 1909 and 1949 is when the Chinese start to claim it. Um, and this is really the trigger um, a Japanese merchant, it's all to do with the guano, uh, petrified bird droppings, uh, is uh, a vital uh, commercial enterprise, uh, valuable fertilizer uh, used for all kinds of anything that you can use phosphorus for. Um, Japanese merchant is found on <coughs> Pratas Island, and bear in mind, of course, that Japan is occupying Taiwan at this point, so it's not that far to Pratas. Um, and it's actually the Americans that find out about it and get a bit worried about what the Japanese intentions are. And the Americans then ask the Chinese government uh, if they're intending to claim Pratas. And it's them that really uh, this all gets going. And it all it becomes very emotive because it's in the context of other things which are happening in China at the same time. You have the Boxer Rebellion. You have the, you've had the Sino-Japanese War a few years before. Um, anxiety about you know, what the Europeans are up to and all the rest of it. And it's in that context, really, that the Chinese government starts, to, or at least the authorities in southern China start to take an interest in what's going on. Um, but this is all coming, and this is what I'm trying to write about at the moment in another book, um, emerging Chinese ideas about territory. Um, you've had the, the Qing Empire, which... Uh, didn't formally set its boundaries, by and large, except when forced to by other powers. Um, but a, a sense among nationalists that China had been stripped of territories that were rightfully its, and that throughout the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, you have intellectuals, academics, politicians pontificating about where China's rightful boundaries should be. And this is often left to the private sector. Uh, so this is a, a book, a map published by the Zhonghua Book Publishing Company, not a government outlet. And the point is it's contrasting the area that's controlled by China then, and you'll see it only includes the Paracel Islands down here, with China's rightful territory, which obviously stretches into Afghanistan, Iran, the whole of peninsula Southeast Asia, and so on, up into Manchuria. So there's a sense here of kind of where China should rightfully be compared to where it is now. And we don't really know why the person who drew this map drew it like this, but the fact that it includes, for example, the Sultanate of Sulu down here suggests that this is about places that in the past sent tribute to the emperor in Beijing 
And so therefore, the person who drew this map thinks, well, they, those people obviously thought themselves part of a Chinese empire, so therefore they should be part of a Chinese nation state in the post-revolutionary uh, situation. Um, so really, the struggle through the 1920s and 30s is about try, where, where the boundaries are going to be and how you, how you justify those. And the South China Sea gets caught up in, in this almost by accident. Um, Japan, meanwhile, is carrying on with its guano exploits. Um, and then from the 1920s onwards, it's not so much private sector people doing it as the state and, and the military start to get more involved uh, in it as well. Um, and then the French, uh, who are obviously the colonial power in Indochina, um, they, uh, well, it's not really so much the French government as uh, a man called Arnaud Krempf, uh, who used to run the Indo-Chinese Institute for Oceanography in, in Nyachang on the coast of, of, of Indochina. Um, and he wanted funding for his uh, institute. And so in order to justify spending money on uh, his, his ship, uh, he said he was going to go and fly the flag for the French Empire. Um, and he basically kind of you know, led the French Empire by the nose, really, to some extent, into... Uh, acts of uh, sovereignty on the islands, uh, all really to fund what he was doing uh, for his rather idiosyncratic research on, on coral. Um, but the French then sort of began to take more of an interest uh, as the 30s wore on in the context of, of, of competition with Japan uh, in the run-up to the what would become the Second World War. So this is a very complicated slide. But the point is that <coughs> the early 1930s get extremely complex in this little bit of history because you've got a lot of things happening simultaneously. So China, having fractured into different warlording controlled areas um, in the 1910s and 20s, is unified under Chiang Kai-shek in 1928. Um, and then as part of this process of trying to <laughs> think about where the country's proper boundaries should be, um, and there are still arguments going on and internally about this, uh, the government or the, you know, pronounces these inspection regulations that they're going to actually regularise the maps of the country. It's still not regularised uh, even as late as 1930. In fact, it goes on even longer. Um, around the same time, the French government sends the authorities to... Uh, so sends a ship to the Spratly Islands to go and stick a flag, but they fail to properly annex it. They don't announce it. Uh, they do it in the wrong way. They just sort of declare an area of sea and all the islands in it uh, to be French territory, and the British object. Um, meanwhile, Japan is invading Manchuria, and there's fighting going on. And then right in the middle of this, right at the end of this, um, <coughs> actually on Bastille Day, 1933, France announces the annexation of six of the Spratly Islands, um, and then publishes it in the uh, official newspaper uh, nine days, no, six, 11 days later. Um, so July 1933 is really when this kind of kicks off because the French annex the Spratly Islands, the uh, Japanese have also got claims there, and the Chinese are starting to think about a claim. But this is actually a very confused response. So there's, that's the... I love this bit because it's the, it's the banality of governments. So there's... Here's, here's France claiming sovereignty over bits of the South China Sea, you know, right next to something about, um, I think it's his artificial millstone regulations and the docks in Boulogne. It's just the kind of, you know, the banality of government <coughs> there. Um, so um, what happens, I mean, this, I'm cutting a long story short here. Um, <coughs> China gets very confused in 1933 about which islands the French have annexed. Um, and so, uh, in the end, it decides that um, it's not going to protest against the French annexation because it can't prove that it owns the Spratly Islands. So, but then it, the government asks, sets, sets up this committee to regularise the maps. And one of its jobs is to work out where all the islands are in the South China Sea and potentially, therefore, which islands China should claim. But interestingly, what this committee does takes the British maps and translates the names into Chinese. So it's not like there are indigenous existing Chinese names. Um, so you can see those of you, anyone who's Chinese, will realise that North Danger, Bei Xian, is North Danger in Chinese. Yeah? Uh, Spratly, named after Richard, the boy from the East End, is transliterated as Sibala Tuo. Um, Money Island, uh, Jin Yin Dao, Money. Yeah? Antelope Reef, 
Lin Yang Gao, uh, named after the British ship the Antelope, which surveyed it in 1810. So these names, uh, some of them were changed subsequently in 1947 or 83, but many of them remain the same. So, for example, Money Island is named after him, William Taylor Money. Uh, but in Chinese, it's still called Jin Yin Dao because they think it was notes and coins money, not William Taylor Money. Um, and these names, to the best of my estimating, all were taken from this edition of the uh, UK published China Sea Directory. So the Chinese names are, in fact, by and large, the British names that have been given a Chinese rendering in many cases. Um, and this was then published on a map in 1935, and the James Shoal, as we saw, is down here, right at the bottom. Um, and you can see down there that the, uh, the James Shoal... So the, um, the Zheng Mu, but what they didn't... They had trouble translating the word shoal, which comes from the English word shallow, uh, but they used the word tan, which means sandbank. Um, and you can see... Uh, uh, so this is tan and sandbank. And so sandbank is a sort of ambiguous word. Is it underwater? Is it above water? Um, my question is why they chose this sort of unremarkable underwater feature. My guess is they simply copied this map published by Stanford's in London. James Shoal marked there and the Vanguard Bank marked there. And then both of those were then marked um, on, the, on this Chinese map of 1935. I, I'm simply, they simply copied the British maps. Um, now, James Shoal gets this wrong name and then, unfortunately for the rest of the world, um, becomes declared to be a piece of territory um, by this guy, uh, a, the, the founder <coughs> of the Chinese uh, Geography Society, um, and who then, uh, Bai Mei Chu, who then draws a map. And this is the key point. So, so he draws his own map privately again in 1936, publishes it, um, and he marks the James Shoal here and the Vanguard Bank as islands. You can see with little solid lines around them. And he also invents a whole load of other islands that don't exist up here, <laughs> misses out the Spratleys, um, and put, but he gets the Paracels about right. So he's a professor of geography. Um, and then he draws this, and this is the innovation. This is the first time, really, that a Chinese claim stretches down this far uh, in the South China Sea. And as you can see, it's based on two mistakes. It's based on a mistranslation of the name and then a piece of bad map making drawing it into an island. Yeah? So unfortunately <laughs> the geopolitical confrontation in the South China Sea is caused by this guy and his translation and bad map making. Um, and, but the Chinese government doesn't subscribe to this view just yet. So as late as 1943 um, the Chinese government, it's, the Ministry of Information publishes a handbook um, she's supposed to inform the outside world all about China during the Second World War. Um, and you'll see that in the, on page one, it says the territory stretches down as far as the Paracel Islands. So 1943, China is only claiming the Paracels in the northern part of the South China Sea. Um, this changes within four years. Mainly because of this guy, these two guys. This, uh, uh, he's, he's a student of Professor Bai Mei Chu, the, the professor I mentioned before, and there he is on the Chinese voyage to the South China Sea in 1946. Um, he and a colleague are seconded from their university departments to the ministry to advise them on which territory to claim. Um, in the meantime, the Philippines gets independence and starts talking about its own claims on the islands, um, and this that obviously encourages the Chinese to move a bit quicker. Um, this is the first time you see the the U-shaped line marked on a government document. Here it is, a map drawn by the guy I just showed you in the previous slide uh, and still has the, the James Shoal down here as the southern, southernmost point. So he's the person that takes Professor Bai's conclusions into government. Um, again, there, was, there are a few more mistakes uh, in the map making, but it's uh, slightly too detailed. And this is... Prompted by these ideas and with the help of this map, uh, the Republic of China uh, sends a naval expedition down to the Spratly Islands for the first time, lands there on the 12th of December 1946 and plants a stone and says this is China for the first time. Ironically, the only reason that the Republic of China Navy was able to make this expedition was because the United States had just <coughs> given them a whole load of ships uh, to uh, fight the communists. So the USS Decker 
becomes the RO, the Chinese ship Taiping, and makes its voyage down to what is now called in Chinese Taiping Island, named after the ship. So France is still in the game, China is still in the game, um, and so there are sort of battles to stick flags in islands during late 46 and, and, and early 47. Um, in the Spratlys, the French get there first and the Chinese follow. It's the other way around um, in the Paracel Islands uh, further north. Um, and so you do, there are, well, there isn't really a confrontation in the Spratlys, but in the Paracels, there's the French try to force the Chinese off an island, uh, abandon the, the effort, and they retreat and they claim. So they, for a while, the Chinese are in the eastern half of the Paracels, and the French are in the, the western half. So then finally, in 1948, uh, China publishes this map. But this is, this is the map of the first line in the South China Sea published externally by a Chinese government. And you can see the 11 dashes here, stretching all the way down to the James Shoal around here. But it's never clear exactly what this line means. Um, all the information at the time suggests that what this line meant was that China was claiming ownership of these features in there. The problem is that in the years since then, and particularly in the last 20 years, um, an argument has emerged in China that <coughs> they weren't just claiming the islands, they were claiming the water and all the rights to the fish and the minerals and everything in there. Now, there's no evidence of that in documents at the time. That's, that's an argument that has been developed much more recently than that. But that's really what the problem is. So that when Vietnam is drilling for oil you know, somewhere here, these are not islands, these are underwater features, this is the Vanguard Bank here, then China comes along and says, ah, oh, that's, that's inside our U-shaped line here, these, this, that's our oil, yeah? So that's really where it comes from. And then Indonesia has a, you know, what's, you know, draws a line 200 nautical miles from here, and that overlaps with this bit of the line. Uh, the Philippines, there's a large gas field about here, the Philippines wants to develop that, um, and again, China is preventing that, and... and uh, Brunei and Malaysia are also facing the same pressures. That's the map. So really what I want to sort of say is that there is nothing particularly logical about the Chinese claim. Um, it was based on uh, understandings of history about the tribute system and the idea that that could be just really copied and pasted into the modern state system uh, and then bad translations and, and, and poor map making. So the other countries, I'll talk much less about the other claims. Uh, they're not quite as complicated. Uh, this is one, another one of the outposts. This is obviously a Vietnamese one, um, tiny. Uh, but the, the Vietnamese would claim that sort of certain actions by, sorry, excuse me, the um, uh, 19th century emperors. Um, so many European ships were being wrecked on the islands. It was actually quite useful for the Vietnamese rulers to go and salvage cannon from them for use uh, internally um, in uh, internal fighting within uh, what was well what, what became Vietnam. So the emperor authorizes a company to go and uh, grab the cannon for him. This is the kind of evidence which is uh, asserted as uh, as reinforcing a Chinese a Vietnamese claim uh, in our current era. But it's really not until the French come along in the 30s and start to annex it. That's when the French when this, the Vietnamese really start to sort of date their claim. So uh, nothing much happens during the, the Vietnam War, but as soon as American troops leave, the um, Republic of Vietnam starts to think about oil, um, offshore oil, um, and starts to occupy islands again. Um, and actually, Vietnam occupies now more than half of the Spratly Islands. Uh, it doesn't get as much publicity because they're nowhere near as impressive as the Chinese ones, but they are the largest... Uh, control of features. Now, around this time, late 60s, um, the economic interest really shifts from guano um, uh, to oil. And actually, it's the UK that funds um, some oil surveys uh, in this area. And people suddenly wake up to the idea that there is a significant amount of offshore oil on the continental shelves down here. And that really gets the Vietnamese interested and gets the, the Philippines interested as long as with Brunei and Malaysia as well. Sorry, excuse me, I've gone backwards. Um, now, the Philippines' claim is slightly comical, really, um, because obviously they're an American colony up until 46. Not much is done. 
Um, and then immediately afterwards, um, the government has other priorities. But there are, uh, it does, does make some moves in that direction. But it's really, um, it's really this fellow, Thomas Clomer. Um, Thomas Clomer is, a, uh, is an entrepreneur. Uh, he had been a journalist on the Manila Bulletin. He knew about shipping. He'd done a law qualification. Um, he had um, set up the Philippine Maritime Institute to, to, sail, to train sailors because the official one went on strike. And so he rapidly set one up <coughs> in the space of a few days uh, and offered two-month courses in seamanship and then basically sent the students to work on his fishing boats uh, so he got free labour, and when he got, but he got paid. People paid to learn how to become seamen. Um, so he was, he was a kind of, he was a, he was an entrepreneur and, and probably a smuggler and various other things. Um, anyway, 1956, uh, he and his brother get together and uh, decide to claim the Spratly Islands for themselves, not on behalf of the Philippines, but an independent country called Freedom Land, uh, where he would be the head of state. Um, and uh, he gave gave all his friends and relations. Um, you know, uh, uh, official titles and things. Um, now, I, when I first started researching this, I thought this was kind of comical and, and, and inconsequential, but he does this in 56, and that actually kicks off a whole other round of um, territory claiming. It makes the Chinese angry, makes the Taiwanese angry, makes the Vietnamese angry, uh, makes the French angry, and everybody then starts launching expeditions to the ships, to, to the islands, again in 56, all because of this fella. Um, uh, it doesn't have a very happy ending because um, in the 1970s, well, he, he gets told to shut up and go away. But he, in the 1970s, when oil uh, comes onto the horizon, um, President Marcos uh, goes and sends the Marines onto the islands, as you can see here. Um, and up pops Clover and says, these are my islands. Uh, you, you, know, you need to pay me for them. Uh, so Marcos does what dictators do and shoves him in jail and uh, at the same time impounds all his ships and his other parts of his business empire. Um, and he keeps them there until um, Cloma is forced to agree to hand over the islands for a single peso to the Philippine government. And that was all the compensation he ever got for all his troubles. Um, 74, the Chinese take over the western half of the Paracels from South Vietnam. But they're... Taiwan is down in, in the Spratlys, but no uh, mainland Chinese. Uh, this is Swallow Reef, what it looks like in its natural state. Um, and this is what it looks like now. So the Malaysians were, in fact, the first people to build a runway um, on a reef like this. And they did so uh, in the early mid-'80s. They occupy five features now, um, the close, all, all close to Borneo. Um, it's not until a few years later, a couple of years later, that the Chinese PRC um, get into the act. Um, they fairly um, they start with surveys. They work out which reefs they're going to occupy. By this point, pretty much anything that's worth occupying has already been occupied. The Philippines, the Vietnamese, the Taiwanese are on most of them. Malaysians on a couple. So the only things that are left are really um, either just tiny little rocks or actually things which are underwater at high tide. So this is Johnson Reef South. Um, and uh, the Vietnamese catch on to what the Chinese are doing. So both the Chinese and the Vietnamese literally land at the same time in March 1988. Um, there is literally a fist fight on the islands between the two. The Chinese withdraw. The Vietnamese Marines are standing on the sandbank here, up to their knees in water, and then the Chinese machine gun a lot of them. Um, and actually, they, this was filmed, and amazingly, this was then broadcast on Chinese television a few years ago as part of a history of the, the Chinese Navy. So you can, you can find this on YouTube if you want to go and watch uh, the shooting of the Marines on Johnson Reef. Anyway, so uh, China, in this period, grabbed five, so seven, a total of seven features. Um, and this is what it looks like really today. So you can see the Vietnamese flag is on more than half of them. But the Chinese ones, their their mischief reef is very close to the to the Philippine one. There, they're they're very strategically located and they're much bigger than any of the others. The Philippines ones are up here. The Malaysian ones are down here. And there's well, there's one, but there's an adjunct the Taiwan controls up here. So that really is the sort of the current situation in the Spratlys uh, and in the Paracels. China controls all of them. So the question really is what this what the U-shaped line means. Um, and this is the map. This is the first time that 
the map was sent to an international body. This was sent to the, to the UN Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf in 2009. They sent this map, but it's very vague. The language is very, very vague. It doesn't know what exactly, you know, uh, relevant waters. What, you know, how, how far do these relevant waters extend? Um, and so this really is what the, what, the, what the dispute is about. So in 2012, uh, Sinuk, the Chinese offshore oil company, uh, put out a tender for blocks, which, as you can see, directly overlap blocks which um, the Vietnamese government was also putting out for tender. So there are rival claims, I think, yes, I've marked it in. So where, you see, you know, I was talking about Repsol and its troubles, you see, it's an area which the Chinese government has has leased, has given a lease to the same bit of seabed to one company, and the Vietnamese government has given a lease to another company. Um, so it's partly about oil and gas uh, going on right now, but there aren't actually huge reserves of oil and gas in the region. There are, you know, things that would be significant for Vietnam and the Philippines, but it's it's not a new Persian Gulf. Um, this is the. And it signs this is when the Coast Guard patrols these waters as if they are a frontier. And you can see these, these right things. So they, again, finding confrontations to do with fish. Um, um, and fish, oil, and gas are the, are the main things which are driving the, the confrontation. So when in Hainan Island, or Hainan Province, issued some new regulations, they offered more subsidies to fishing in the Spratlys. So part of this is, is being driven actually by government subsidies, that the Chinese government will subsidise fishermen to go into disputed areas um, to protect the national rights and so forth. If those subsidies didn't exist, the chances are there would be much less confrontation. Um, this is up north. This is, the, this is the sea between China and, China and, and Vietnam. Now... This shows you the problems of moving forward in terms of trying to resolve the disputes. So Vietnam and China uh, in 2000 agreed a boundary in the Gulf of Tonkin to this point here. Um, now, at this point in the sea here, it becomes an issue over who controls these islands, where you would draw, draw the boundary. If Vietnam was to get sovereignty over these features, then the boundary would go that way as a sort of halfway point. If China was to get them, the boundary would go this way. But up until this point here, it doesn't really matter. You could draw this line easily. So, just to make it easier, so that, that red part of the line there. Now, the problem is that there is a dash. One of the nine dashes is here. So it's obvious that if China and Vietnam agree that this is their maritime boundary, <coughs> then this line becomes irrelevant. You just rub it out. Yeah? The problem is... China won't agree to rub this line out because if you can rub one dash out, well, you could rub all nine of them out. Yeah? <laughs> so therefore, China will not agree to this perfectly sensible maritime boundary because of the implications for the other dashes uh, on, on the line. And this is the area where the two have come into confrontation. If you remember in 2014, there were lots of pictures of um, Vietnamese and Chinese ships bashing into each other. That was sort of down here near Trinh Island. But there are other regular things going on up here. And this is what the Indonesian problem is, is that that area there is the overlap between their exclusive economic zone claimed from Natuna um, and the, um, the Nine Dash Line down there. Um, and these are really the three areas in terms of oil and gas claims uh, which are hot spots right now. So, um, oh, quacky, sorry, I've, done, I've pressed something too hard. Um, right, there we go. Um, uh, so the Reed Bank has got a lot of natural gas under it. The Vanguard Bank, which is where Repsol was trying to drill. <coughs> James Shoal, which is where Malaysia and Brunei want to, um, want to drill. Um, and this is, you know, all these countries are coming under a lot of pressure from China to concede uh, their, their development rights there. Um, we had a, I'll quickly through 2016. This is a useful map. This is what, if the law of the sea was applied exactly, um, this is what, the, what it would be like. So the the nine dash line would disappear. Each country would claim uh, a 200 nautical mile limit out, and there would be islands of disputed sovereignty, little 12 nautical mile things around here. Um, obviously, what this means is that China's exclusive economic zone would be limited to this part of the sea up here, um, and that obviously disadvantages it uh, considerably compared to the other countries. Um, I can talk a bit more about that map, but I'm running out of time. 
Um, the point is that um, China rejects that ruling. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> um, it's in the book. I'll, I'll leave that map up there just in case, because might, that might help answer some questions and things. But so I hope I've given you some idea of the, the complexity. So that the historical part is very important in the sense that it, it explains why people believe the things they do. But if you look at the evidence, it doesn't really add up, I think, to a lot of what's said about it. Um, there are, I would say, to, to summarise, there are really three sets of disputes here. There are disputes about the islands themselves, who owns the islands. There are disputes about the spaces in between the islands, as in whose rules matter, who has the right to extract the resources, who has the rights to sail there, so forth. And then on top of that, you have the sort of geopolitical uh, disputes about, you know, um, between the US and China, between China and Japan, China and India potentially, about who can sail through here unimpeded and so forth. And that I think is why the South China Sea is dangerous because it's these three sets of disputes that overlap in a way that they don't overlap anywhere else in the world. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's good to know that uh, the sort of foibles of cartography, which seem to throw up these things everywhere, are to blame here as well. Uh, but uh, let's um, open up the floor to questions. I have immediately one, two, three. <laughs> Just run on the front row. Okay. Well, do I need a mic, first of all? Uh, no, I think people can hear you. Well, first of all, thank you for fascinating uh, both of you. Um, apart from history and resources, which you've um, uh, explained in your presentation, um, obviously uh, China is now uh, fortifying a lot of the features uh, in the South China Sea, um, suggesting that the South China Sea is not just more than resources in the sense that it is a theater uh, through which uh, a lot of trade and importation of energy uh, resources um, pass through. In fact, it's, um, most of the world's trade passes through the South China Sea. Uh, and China depends uh, on this trade for regime survival. And hence, it's now fortifying the entire area, uh, which is now placed under the province of Hainan. Uh, it's now part of China's province. Apart from the administrative uh, jurisdiction, uh, Hainan is now turning into a naval base for China, um, housing its nuclear submarines, um, as, and, and all the features in the South China Sea uh, are now, um, you know, have installed uh, missiles. Um, so apart from the uh, picture showing all these flags uh, with the um, Southeast Asian nations, there is no doubt that China's military might is predominant. And of course, uh, through missiles threatening the access of even U U.S. aircraft carriers, uh, the so-called anti-access and uh, regime uh, denial. So my question to you is that um, because of China's um, military dominance, because of China's uh, economic might, and all the Southeast Asian claimants uh, are now um, defer in one way or another uh, to China's um, coercion, if you like, and even the Philippines uh, is now forgetting about the decision uh, of uh, the Hague, uh, the, the hopeless, um, uh, the legal uh, juris uh, jurisdiction, the claim, setting that aside. Um, so my question to you is, uh, how is it going to play out? And China is unlikely to give in, um, considering uh, all its military installations and considering this as a, as a um, conduit for China's lifeblood. Um, do you have any feel how mm -hmm. this is going to play out? <laughs> Mm. Do you want to answer that, or should I harvest a couple more questions? Uh, well, just do, yes, let's do that. I mean, I will give you give you a proper answer right. for sure. Yes. Mm. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. Can you be a bit more specific about the oil and gas position? Because it's my understanding that until you've actually drilled, you don't know whether there's oil and gas there. Mm -hmm. The impression that you give of is that there's a great deal of dispute between the various countries, which would suggest that maybe nobody's actually drilled. <laughs> I think 
appraisers with a little knowledge remember that um, somebody decided to drill off Greenland and they lost $700 million for the number of dry holes and they didn't find anything. I mean, has anybody actually drilled in this disputed area? <laughs> and third question. <coughs> and then I'll yeah, do another well, round. Mine's very much on the basis of the uh, first question, but if you could just have a uh, clear idea, given that this is an international route of immense importance, I mean, the Malacca Straits are the busiest seaway in the world, and Japan's um, reliance on its route for its oil supplies and its mineral supplies, and then particularly its oil supplies, what has been the attitude of the Chinese so far towards international shipping movements? And again, um, is this causing strategic concern to Japan in particular? Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Just to, yeah. just to fill in on that question, if I can, sorry to interrupt you, but could you just tell us what the military might of China is and what they've done so far. You showed us some aircraft carriers, you showed us some Marines getting machine guns, you showed us the islands all being fortified. What have they done and what have they got from the Ukraine, which hopefully fits with that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, they all sort of fit together a bit. I mean, I would say there are sort of four reasons really why China has taken a position it has. I mean, st strategic questions, as you imply, is that the island bases are positioned in a way that um, you know, projects Chinese, there's a down here, should project Chinese power much closer to the Malacca Straits and therefore into the Indian Ocean too. Um, uh, you see them also in terms of what might be called a, a bastion strategy of hiding uh, ballistic missile submarines in the deep water in the middle here. The submarines are based here in uh, Yulin. Uh, you've got bases um, on, the, on the Paracels. You've got bases in the Spratleys. And a strong suggestion that China really wants to put a third corner of the triangle here and then be able to control that water there and hide its um, second strike capability uh, in there. Um, and, um, and also in, in terms of the context of trying to, you know, some kind of invasion of Taiwan, keeping the Americans out of the picture uh, at some point. So that there are kind of clearly strategic reasons why uh, China wants access. Add the resources in, oil and gas and the fish, uh, add in bureaucratic self-interest, the fact that the Navy and the Coast Guard and the coastal provinces get extra subsidies for the flying the flag and, and generally bigging up their role. And then you have the whole question of nationalism and, and whose territory is it anyway. Um, there's an awful lot of pressure on the Southeast Asian countries, but they, the, the one thing that they have not yet conceded, any of them, is joint development. So uh, all of them still claim that they have the rights to the oil and gas and the fish in this uh, in their ex exclusive economic zones, um, and they have refused, despite an awful lot of Chinese pressure, to concede joint development. Uh, so, for example, Duterte in the Philippines, uh, the question is what happens to this gas on the reed bank here. Now, the Philippines, there's a, a gas field called Malampaya, which is uh, run by Shell, which is about here. The gas is piped onto Luzon and generates a third of the electricity that's used in Luzon and Manila that field is going to run out in eight or nine years. Um, the easy solution is simply that you build a pipeline to this one, plug it in, and the gas keeps on going. There's 13 trillion cubic feet of gas there. And we know that because there have been surveys, and there have, I'm not sure there have been test drills, but there have been definitely there have been surveys, and it's reasonably well known what's there. Um, the Chinese are refusing to allow that. They want joint development. The Philippines are offering them a joint venture, i.e., your Chinese company joins our uh, venture and you pay taxes and revenues to us. And the Chinese say, no, no, we, we want to split ownership of the field 50 50 or whatever between us. Uh, and they're refusing to do that. Uh, Brunei is getting the same pressure, Malaysia is getting the same pressure, Vietnam is getting the same pressure. Um, we're not talking about huge amounts of oil. I mean, I, I'll, if anyone really wants the figures, um, the, U, the US Energy Information Administration did a sort of a, a good survey of what was known. The problem is that the from the Chinese side, a whole load of made-up numbers were put out about 20 years ago where they basically added up all of the oil fields around the entire South China Sea, including bits that were outside the Nine Dash Line. And obviously, the area on the continental shelf down here is where most of the oil is. 
Um, the deep water has got almost nothing in it because it's crust, ocean, oh no, can't, uh, earth's crust. There's no, there's no sedimentary rocks there. Um, and even the disputed bits have not been properly surveyed except for the reef bank uh, and here. So uh, there's, a bit up, there's a fair bit up here, but an undisputed Chinese. Um, so, yes, oil and gas is part of it. Um, but the, the numbers themselves, the Chinese talk about numbers which are sometimes 10 times as much as Western oil companies imagine is there. Um, in terms of um, Japan and Korea, I mean, ever since Korea, so Japan turns the nuclear power stations off, my back of the envelope calculation, one oil or gas carrier tanker has to go through the South China Sea every seven hours to keep the lights on in Tokyo. So that's, that's an awful lot. And obviously, I mean, you know, if, if, if China closed this somehow, you know, the ships could go round, you know, the bottom of Australia or something, but they just, it just adds cost and, and, and risk to, to that pipeline, uh, supply line. Um, so, yes, it is very important for Japan, um, which is why Japan has been playing a careful game or quiet game of sort of my enemy's enemy is my friend um, and bolstering the coast guards in the Philippines and Vietnam and so forth to try to uh, increase their resistance capacity uh, against China. Um, uh, Korea, of, I, mean, I mean, the vast majority of trade through the South China Sea goes to or from China, of course, because it's, it's there's so much with the world's manufacturing. Um, but it's obviously vital for Taiwan, South Korea, Japan um, as, as, as well, and I guess the west coast of the US. Um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, there have been no, let me think, there have been, China has not interrupted the flow of civilian shipping um, in the South China Sea, let's make that clear. But uh, it has certainly obstructed military vessels, uh, and from the American perspective, you can't have one without the other. You, freedom of navigation has to be absolute. It can't just be, it can't be that, because if China is picking and choosing which vessels it allows to go where, then that's not freedom of navigation. Um, it's obviously something that, um, in some ways, China has something in common with the Southeast Asian countries on this. Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia all have bits in their domestic legislation restricting <coughs> military vessels, but they they don't do anything about it. China's the only one that does anything about it. Um, later this year, maybe even right now, a Royal Navy ship will be sailing through the area. Uh, HMS Albion just stopped in Brunei a couple of days ago, so it might, even as we speak, be in, in some of the disputed waters, possibly. HMS Sutherland is supposed to go there at the end of the month. Um, so the UK may find itself you know, getting involved in some of this um, within some short space of time. And, this, and we're obviously there partly to bolster the US, but also to bolster Japan. US, UK, Japan defense relations are getting uh, increasingly close. Um, so yeah, so the UK is playing its little part in it as well. Uh, military might, um, well, I'm not really the, the kind of you know, person who can tell you great detail, but um, China has three navies. Uh, it has a Navy Navy, has a police, <coughs> na well, uh, has a police Navy, and then it has the unofficial Navy, which is the maritime militia. Um, and um, you kind of see them, you, know, you see operations here tend to involve a sort of a mixture of, of all three, that it tends to be the maritime militia who pretend to be fishermen, but they're the kind of fishermen that don't catch fish, but they just drive armoured fishing boats so that when they smash into somebody else's fishing boat, they can say, oh, it's a fishing boat. You know, the fact that it's got extra reinforcing on it um, is just a, a detail. Um, and then the Coast Guard will be behind them, and then over the horizon will be the Navy. Um, so you have to take all three into account. Um, so I mean, you know, I mean, I think if, 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 if we're talking about a sort of U.S.-China confrontation, the U.S. is going to win. If we're talking about a U.S.-China-Japan confrontation, we're still probably talking about a J Japanese win. But but if we're talking about China, Vietnam, or any of the other Southeast Asian states, there's, there's no no question really. Um, I mean, it, if China really wanted to, it could occupy every single feature in, in an afternoon. Uh, I mean, some of the Philippines-occupied ones are nature reserves with five or six marines sitting on them, really. The Vietnamese ones are a bit more fortified and the Malaysian ones a bit more. Um, so, yeah, the Vietnamese might be able to defend themselves for a bit, <coughs> but none of the others could. So, um, yeah, you have... Um, I mean, China hasn't fought a naval battle since 1974, and that was a very low-level one against the Vietnamese. Uh, so, therefore, hasn't really fought one... Until you go back to the 50s and the sort of 
mainland Taiwan confrontations really then. Um, so nobody knows how good they are, but you know, their ships are getting bigger, that's for sure, um, and they're looking, they look more impressive. But nobody knows whether they'll all work together. Could you just say a word about British claims? <laughs> yes, it's a good story. Do you, are you asking me because you know? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, one, you might, one, yeah. one might say that the British had very good claims, the Spratleys and Scarborough <coughs> and so on and so forth. Did they ever actually get round to, at any historical period, enforcing them? Because you mentioned the French. Right. We did mention the British. Yeah, yes, it's true. Should I take that one or any others? Michael, do you want to bring that question as well? You've um, largely answered the question I was going to ask, which was how did Britain come into this? Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned that we have a couple of ships um, in the area. Um, and this is all to do with uh, the Lord Sea and the freedom of navigation, which is obviously uh, a very important principle that has to be maintained. But um, why do we bother? Why can't we leave it to other people? Is there a, is there a NATO angle to this? I seem to remember that the Americans started to invoke NATO at some point. I thought, my God, <laughs> they can invoke NATO in the South China Sea. We're really done. <laughs> 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 right, they overlap quite nicely. Um, so, yes, in previous versions of this talk, I've, I've sort of, uh, I've, my first slide has been why Britain owns the South China Sea, um, because we were the first to actually formally stake a claim in 1877, I think, and it was all to do with northern Borneo, uh, Labuan, um, and a couple of guano miners attached to the northern Borneo or the central Borneo company. Uh, who um, wanted to go and stick their flag in it. Um, but the, there was some doubt as to whether they ever actually raised the flag and did what was necessary. Um, but, um, and it was a rather not unpleasant thing. Where they, they imported a whole load of migrant Chinese workers to dig up the guano, treated them badly. There was a bit of a mutiny. Um, one of the mutinying Chinese workers got shot dead. Um, and then the surviving ones are put on trial, not, not the person, not the British guy that shot him. Um, so, yes, there was, that was an unpleasant experience. So, we, but we claimed uh, Spratly Island and Amboyna Key only, so just two features, name features. Um, so, when the French come along in 1933 uh, and also claim Spratly, the British politely remind them that we claimed it first. Um, and there's a, there's a great uh, academic paper based on the archives in Kew uh, with great government documents basically saying, do we want these islands? Um, uh, well, sort of. Can we be bothered to pay for them? No. <laughs> uh, uh, do we mind if the French get them? Well, it's better than the Japanese getting them. Um, but if the French don't get them, then we ought to do something about it. <laughs> it's one of those things that goes round and round and round. Um, and then uh, I think the Second World War kicks off. Um, eventually, by the time it's resolved. And there's another great piece in 56, um, when um, after the Thomas Clomer expedition and the other states coming in, uh, there's a document in the archives, and it, it's the Admiralty basically saying, we should do something, and the Foreign Office saying, are you sure, and the Australians getting involved. Um, and then Anthony Eden has written, and what about the oil <laughs> in the margin? <laughs> Which, of course, then, then of course, Suez comes along. And in the great way, basically... The, the FCO is pushing to do nothing. Uh, the, um, <laughs> the Eden is saying um, we've got to do something, but then Suez comes along, Eden gets pushed out, and so the Foreign Office wins. Um, so uh, the, um, we ha I think we haven't... I'm not sure whether we've technically formally renounced the UK claim or whether we've just let it lapse. I, think, I don't think anybody wants to. Um, in terms of the UK, I mean, in terms of actual um, things that we can put on a bit of paper, so... Three Commonwealth states, Brunei, Malaysia, <laughs> Singapore. Um, FPDA, the five power defence arrangements, you know, it came out of the end of uh, um, you know, when Malaysia became independent. It was basically to stop Malaysia and Singapore going to war with each other. So Malaysia, Singapore, UK, New Zealand, um, Australia are in the five power defence arrangements. Um, so we are committed to, committed to something vague to do with the defence of Malaysia and Singapore. Um, and um, 
we also, as you say, have an interest in field navigation, um, and we have energy companies which are active uh, in the region. Um, there is no NATO role in it directly. NATO has taken an interest in North Korea for proliferation, anti-proliferation reasons. So there is a NATO uh, relationship with South Korea and Japan, but it doesn't. It, it's only there. It doesn't go any further south. Um, the, I mean, really, there are kind of there are two European states that have direct interests, which is us and France. And France obviously still has its Pacific territories. Um, so, and increasingly, we're getting joint manoeuvres. There's just HMS Albion was just um, doing manoeuvres with two French uh, naval warships in the Java Sea um, last year because we didn't have a ship. We haven't had a ship in Asia for four years, but now we've got three. Uh, we've got two right now, and a third one coming along. Um, and uh, so last year we put uh, two or three helicopters onto a French um, uh, assault ship and sent it uh, to the Pacific. So yeah, so the UK is definitely getting more active uh, in this part of the world. Um, and I think largely at the encouragement uh, of Japan and, and the US. Uh, the G7 uh, put in their statement something about maritime security. So it's, it's becoming a sort of issue. But um, uh, it's obviously you know, it's just a question of whether we've got enough ships and in the right place to, to do something. I have one last question here, please, and then we must close. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could just clarify the, uh, this question of the, of the, of the high seas, I mean, mm -hmm. how much of the area is uh, free for international shipping, and if all the territorial claims were okay, mm -hmm. so, uh, how much, how, the, there are proliferation of islands, well, there must be sea lanes, international sea lanes everywhere, aren't there? Well, I mean, the, <clears throat> the conventional understanding of the law of the sea, and that, and China is, is challenging that, is that everybody can sail everywhere, you know, pretty much. Um, so there's territorial seas which are 12 nautical miles away from land, and the land can be as big as this table, um, and that still counts as land. It still gives you a territorial sea, as long as it's above water at high tide. Um, and a military ship can even sail through that as long as it's on innocent passage. It turns off all its weapon systems and all the rest of it uh, and just goes straight through and doesn't, doesn't hang around. I mean, last July, three Chinese ships sailed through the English Channel, so warships um, uh, on their way to the Baltic. I mean, they did so on the basis of innocent passage because, uh, you know, the British and the French territorial waters meet in the middle. Um, but when I asked a, a Chinese colonel visiting London, you know, I said, well, we did that, you did that here in July, what happens if when the Royal Navy ship sails within 12 nautical miles? Uh, and he said, well, basically, well, British law allows you to do that, but Chinese law doesn't allow you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so this, unfortunately, is the Chinese position. It's kind of like, you know, uh, you know, one law for you and one law for us, unfortunately. So, yeah, even military ships can sail wh wherever they want. Um, in an exclusive economic zone, uh, up to 200 nautical miles out, uh, it doesn't belong to anybody, but the rights to the resources that are in there belong to. So you, the country, the coastal country has the rights to the fish and the oil and the gas and so forth, but it doesn't own the seabed or whatever. So it's more complex. So it's not like there are official sea lanes in that sense. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. your, um, your, your account of, of British sort of cogitations about what to do is sort of... Room does feel actually rather like Falkland Islands, which Britain would have been only too glad to get rid of at any point up to 1982 when the Argentines grotesquely misplayed their hand. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating, and uh, I, for one, am going away knowing a great deal more than uh, I previously did. Thank you. <laughs>